It was dark, cool and quiet, empty most of the time, but at other moments filled with sound and light and the bee sting pains in the crook of his elbow. Maybe it was some sort of karma, a comeuppance from all the times he had hovered over some creature in the exact same position. For the hundreds upon hundreds of blood vials he had pulled from veins both human and other. And not other as in animals, although he had done that too, but otherworldly. Howard Brighton considered himself, for most of his life, a genius. He didn't let it go to his head, enjoying a relatively normal childhood, but the truth of it was always there lurking beneath the surface. It was a good thing, too, because he never grew above 5'5", five five, and physical strength held little interest to him. His power lay elsewhere, and he spent a long time waiting to claim it in full. Growing up in the heat of the technological revolution that let entities like Umbral gain such significance was all he knew and it was almost expected that anyone with above-average intelligence would move into an AI-focused career. It was fascinating, sure, watching artificial intelligence become something more than the sum of all its parts, building and creating and shaping the world into an entirely new thing. But it never gave Howard the spark. As a teen, he was talented in computer sciences, in a middling sort of way. But it wasn't what drew him like a winged insect to a flame. Howard Brighton wanted to know what was inside. Not inside some delicate, incredible machine, but what was inside the living. The original machine. Flesh and blood and bone. He wanted it. Wanted to pick it apart and study it until he knew the pathway of every cell and what lay between the spaces of firing synapses. It was a perfect, visceral, sinewy thing, and he wanted to know it in a way that no other man ever had. Unfortunately, though, as long as people had been walking around with beating hearts in their chests, there had been other people who wanted to deconstruct exactly how that heart thumped on and on. Nowhere near the first to delve into the intricacies of the body, Howard found it infuriatingly easy to find the answer to any question he had between the pages of some book. Hell, somewhere three times older than he was, and right there on the yellow paper of the text was a man asking and answering the same question he was. It wasn't fair. Stingy, greedy, even. Certainly there had to be some honor left among the scientific community. Some rule that said, save some for the rest of us. But there wasn't. So, with a doctorate at 31 years old, and his name whispered along with the words, most brilliant biologist of our time, Howard Brighton was utterly bored and adrift in his life. None of it was different. Nothing gave him the spark. Dog, cat, monkey, snake, chicken, human, even a grasshopper. They all broke down to the same basic parts. He was starving for something warm and alive, with some new novel secret in the socket of their leg or hidden behind the cage of their ribs. Then Umbral found him, and another path was illuminated. It would take less than a year, and Howard could go from biologist to exobiologist. With the change of title, a world of new possibilities would open up to him. Umbral had only needed microbiologists at first. It was nothing but finding an amoeba here, describing an interplanetary virus there. No one ever thought that Umbral would get their hands on any sort of alien life on the macro scale. Even when they had their stroke of luck, it was a bit by accident. It was just a waiting game 
Once the world started to change and lean on technology so heavily, for antiquated laws like the Outer Space Treaty to be repealed. Power was no longer kept under the name of a nation, but under the umbrella of corporations like the Umbral Group. And for Umbral, dominion over the thermosphere was just another chess piece they could put on the board against their competition. Under the guise of the unassuming weather satellite, SkyTracker, Umbral instead launched the Hyperpulse Particle Cannon. It was equipped to bring down any threat or surveillance satellites to be used against Umbral, but they hadn't accounted for an anomaly to throw off their most powerful weapon yet. Just like there had always been men interested in the working of the human creature, there had always also been people looking skyward and reporting the mysterious things they saw above them. Pictures of unidentified flying objects could be traced back to ancient times, and millions of sightings were still reported year by year. Still, not even Umbral had evidence of anything besides microscopic extraterrestrial life, and it should have stayed that way. But, within minutes of the hyperpulse particle cannon being activated, reality split in high Earth orbit. It was effortless. Just a small crackle and then a seam opening, allowing the almost featureless craft to slip through before shutting once more. The pilot of the craft might have made that trip hundreds of times, and it might have been that comfort that allowed the hyperpulse to fire upon it. The strike was a sharp laser slash, cut short when the umbral handlers down below panicked at the quick activation. The craft fell to Earth, landing somewhere deep in the South American jungle. It had taken everything in Umbral's arsenal to hide the fall and wipe any mentions of it from the internet, but they managed. At the same time, they dispatched recovery crews, only the most discreet and experienced. Howard knew little of the Hyperpulse incident after that. Viridian Laboratories was already active and close enough that it was the obvious choice to hold the craft. A hangar was built below ground, along with a lab dedicated to researching both the craft and anything living or dead that might reside inside. The crash had damaged the craft severely, but regardless it immediately became the most valuable thing that Umbral Group had ever gained. It was so unprecedented, so unexpected, that new methods of security and veils of secrecy were enacted just for the craft. In a single day, almost all the power of Umbral shifted to get the craft hidden and safe. He still remembered the day they brought it in. Doors were built and disguised as the jungle floor leading down to the hangar bay. It was surreal to watch what looked like the earth split and lift displaying the slate gray of the tunnel and ramp leading down. Umbral had commanded the scientists to stay on the lab side of the glass and metal wall separating it from the hangar. It was airtight, and there was to be full decontamination protocols when working with the ship in the future. He didn't know what he had been expecting, but the image of a flying saucer with blinking red and green lights had been banished as the craft was slowly moved beneath the ground. It came on the back of an enormous flatbed, looking so out of place among Umbral's black-on-black -black machinery that it hurt his eyes to look at it. It was so unnatural that it appeared like a paper cutout from a magazine taped over reality. Fake, flat, yet mere bright, all at the same time. The craft was shaped like an odd falcon, with the wings pushed back in a dive. Not a single visible window, light, or even a seam was apparent on the surface of it. Crumpled on one side, the damage from the crash reminded Howard of a paper airplane that had crashed into the ground too hard. It was less damaged than he had expected, though, 
and word filtered through the scientists that it had been regenerating itself, slowly but surely. In days, it would be flawless once more, as if the crash had never happened. The craft should have been the peak of discovery, not just for Umbral, but in the world's history. But it was immediately eclipsed by what they found alongside it. Umbral had sent six soldiers out for the initial first contact with the ship, requesting that pictures and all other sorts of data on the craft be brought back so that the first wave of recovery crews knew what they were getting themselves into. When the original six of the advanced party never returned, they sent another. Under the Eclipse initiative, they had plenty of experts to spare. Three returned. The trio had the data necessary, but there was something off with them, like a sickness that ate away at their minds, but had no pathogenic source that could be found. Luckily for Umbral, they also returned with the collected data from the first six soldiers, and those records painted a murky picture of what had happened. Whatever the pilots were, Something about them distorted the photos and video evidence, but not so much that it was impossible to see that they were something other. In the images, there were three of them, two intact and one potentially deceased. They were taller than the soldiers, almost eight feet, but willowy and slender, almost skeletal in nature. The distortion was the heaviest at the faces, making them unintelligible, black circles atop thin, long necks. In fact, all three pilots looked like the structures of their bodies were dark and bony. Their clothing was the same gunmetal gray of the ship. One pilot carried their dead companion, and in the video evidence, when it wasn't too distorted, a sound could be heard, booming and low, that caused the human soldiers clear agony. They could be heard screaming, along with panic pleas for God and family. All six of them were armed, but when their weapons were inspected, not a single one of them had been fired. The soldiers' skin was split, oozing and red, like they had been face to face with some orphan radiation source. The cause of death was unclear. Then, there was the prisoner. The three soldiers that returned from the second advance party couldn't bring it with them, but as soon as the existence of it was communicated, it immediately became the primary objective. So, horrified by the pilots, the first advance party didn't even get a picture or any information about the prisoner, but the second party came through. On the crumpled part of the ship, there was a place that had buckled, splitting and expelling something from the inside. It was an enormous cube made from some sort of thick glass, nearly the size of a compact car, and perfectly symmetrical. Like the ship, there was no seams or of obvious places where the cube could be opened, and the thing inside of it writhed and slithered along the inside like a viscous jelly. Everyone's agreed upon hypothesis was that the cube had hit the inside of the craft during the crash, but was only halfway knocked through the strange metal hull. As the craft healed itself, it pushed out the cube, like a splinter working its way out of the bottom of someone's foot. By the time the second advance party could document it, the cube was hanging on to the ship by a single corner. When they were ready to retrieve it, the cube had been worked completely out, falling into the jungle floor where it lay until Umbral could move it. At first, it was believed that the gelatinous thing inside was inanimate, but with the pilots gone, the Umbral agents sent to retrieve the cube quickly concluded that whatever was inside of it was indeed alive, and it really, really wanted to come out. A prisoner of the pilots, unintentionally dumped on Earth. Two alien objects, 
one alive and one not, in a single day. The higher-ups at Umbral must have been beside themselves with joy. For weeks, the scientists at Viridian Labs investigated every inch of the ship and the cube, but frustratingly, never found a way inside of either. The prisoner rolled and undulated, its flesh flashing all sorts of colored patterns. It was crammed so tightly inside, and Howard remembered thinking how miserable it must be. Every once in a while, they would see a lone tentacle pressing forward through the mass, but otherwise there were no features on the thing at all. It scared him to the absolute core of his being, but at the same time filled him with a curiosity so strong that it took him days to recognize what it was. Finally, he was feeling the spark again, even if he could only watch the thing from outside its glassy prison and nothing more. They needed to get to it, but the cube was nearly impenetrable, and no one knew what would happen once the prisoner was free. Surely, after so long in captivity, it would be full of violence, unpredictable and dangerous. But leaving it inside wasn't an option either. The Umbral group wanted their alien, and they wanted it as soon as possible. The prisoner raged when it was finally released into its new cell, made of thick, almost impenetrable glass. Its initial prison had been pierced with a tiny, self-contained, thermobaric charge that had managed to break off pieces of the cube in former tests. They had activated the charge once the second cell had been completed, and watched as the creature made its futile escape into the new holding tank. It crawled over the floor, spreading over every inch of the cell, leaving an iridescent trail behind it. The only difference in the cell was a set of AI-driven collection tools, thin robotic arms that would take the samples from the creature needed by the scientists. Everyone in the sterile lab was horrified at the way the creature fought the arms, but Viridian's machine held strong, taking its pound of flesh and handing it over to the scientists once it was done. Howard didn't want to see the thing in pain, but finally being one of the few to have the privilege of looking over the samples first was too tempting a prospect to ignore. Maybe he was a horrible person, but as the weeks passed, all the exobiologists wanted, needed, more. Howard watched, his mouth pulled into a grim line as the robotic arms cut more and more from the prisoner. An ounce, two ounces, a vile fool, a pound. So much of that clinging flesh that the collection arms trembled under the weight of it. They vivisected it, watching it shudder in unimaginable pain and celebrated nonetheless. Because truly, the creature was incredible. Through the properties of the samples, it gained its earthly name, the Chimeric Anomaly, or more simply the Chimera. Before it escaped and destroyed all the beautiful things created from those pieces of it, the Chimera was found to be able to regenerate its damaged body, shift shape and form to some degree, and absorb all necessary nutrients through osmosis. The separated pieces of the creature could still move and articulate, and though the loss of so much of its mass weakened the Chimera, it never truly died. The potential of such a thing, to help humans regenerate lost limbs, breathe underwater, or even extend and achieve long life, was priceless beyond words. Through sleepless nights, Howard worked, drinking down the knowledge like water, the truth of it pumping through his veins like blood. God, it was a brilliant few months, he thought to himself, still unable to even shift around to get more comfortable on his hospital bed. Given the chance, I'd do it all over again. 
He still couldn't raise himself to full consciousness, but he was getting close. Howard could feel the existence of his fingers, his toes, and the awful burns that coated most of his frame. The worst of it was near his temple, where the white phosphorus had scorched him to the bone. So much of him didn't want to even survive, but the creature, the chimera, it might still be out there, and if it was, Howard needed more from it. They should have known, but every member of Viridian Laboratory was too high on being the favored child of Umbril Group and on the monumental nature of their discoveries. Like a creeping cancer, the chimera bled those separate but still articulated cells through the tiniest spaces where the robotic arms connected. The almost invisible tendrils worked away at the metal there, and by the smallest degrees, forced its way to the outside. No one was even aware when the first tendril wriggled out, or the second or third. Alarms weren't sounded until dozens of them had worked free, and they put emergency protocols into action. By then, it was chaos. Trying desperately to get the chimera contained, the sounds of glass shattering in cold storage went unnoticed. All of the separated pieces of the chimera that were still intact, the samples, pushed open the cold storage drawers and slithered out, first finding each other, and then once they were large enough, moving towards the hangar. He saw the first casualty, a woman he had worked with for years, occur when she tried to block a blob of the chimera from progressing. It crawled up her body, into the cavities of her nose, and once she collapsed, back out of her ears and once more onward. Maybe the ones that died there in the beginning were the lucky ones, because once the chimera was free, chaos became a bloodbath. The separated pieces melded with the escaped tendrils, forming one large tentacle that could rip the entire collection of metal off the glass. The chimera spilled forth whole once more. Armed guards flew down into the hangar, guns drawn, bullets flying. Those, the chimera consumed. Some scientists it obliterated in the same way, others it ended with deceptive gentleness, laying their visually unharmed bodies down outside of the lab to be used later. But worst of all, was its voice. Free from its prison, the Chimera forced its consciousness into all of their minds, screaming its agony and rage in wordless sounds and visuals that made Howard's head pound and the acid in his stomach churn. Tears ran down his face as he fled, pushing aside the still-living co-workers he passed and stumbling over the dead. As the Chimera killed, its voice in his head got clearer, the words coalescing from the din. Just fragments at first, and then the chanting of names, those Howard had worked with, and even his own. Like a warning, somehow it knew them all, and Howard knew in his bones that it wouldn't be satisfied until every one of them was dust. Eight names and then five, two, and in the end, nothing but Howard, Howard, Howard. He was screaming. He was furious at his inescapable death and all the things he hadn't achieved. There were no words for the rage he felt, knowing the Chimera was taking his future and the promise of all the great things he would create. Sure, there was fear, but it was small. His anger was a monument. Howard stumbled up the stairs to the first floor, pressing his trembling hand to the lock that would let him access the last weapon he could possibly use 
against the chimera. The lock read his handprint, and the red box, bolted to the wall in the entrance to the security office, clicked open. Above, the words, in case of catastrophic breach, were written. The grenade was Robin Egg Blue, stamped with the letters WP. Howard wasn't a soldier, but in a way, he knew what he had done to the Chimera and so many living things before it in the pursuit of discovery had made him a monster. He knew he would never escape the flames of the white phosphorus grenade, but he didn't care at that point. If the Chimera would not belong to him, tell him its secrets, then he would torch it to the ground. Howard didn't lure the Chimera into the bathroom and pull the pin to save the rest of humankind. No. He was a selfish man, as well as a brilliant one, and if the Chimera was going to deny him, then he'd rather kill the both of them than let it go. Howard, Howard, Howard. It chanted, the wet, heavy sound of it growing closer and closer. He saw the tentacles first, patterns that looked almost like letters flickering and fading in the depths of them before the center mass. He backed up, leading it in, until the chimera had shoved its viscous body through the entire bathroom doorway, expanding on the other side to its full size. Then, he pulled the pin, and everything was searing, white-red, shining pain. His universe narrowed down to the swan song of his nerve endings dying, and the miserable howl of the chimera. Good. Good. I hope it hurts, you fucking bastard. Howard Brighton woke once in the rubble of Viridian, to the faces of soldiers and the blissful sleep that came with an overload of morphine. His next inkling of awareness was in the hospital bed, but he was still deep beneath the drug-induced haze that they had put him in. There was no doubt in his mind that the soldiers had been part of the Eclipse Initiative, and that he had found himself under the tender, cold care of the Umbral Group. His injuries would be beyond the power of any civilian hospital to repair. But Umbral? Hell, he might actually live. In some capacity, at least. During the night, when his blood was swimming with enough medication to give him a chance to actually think without being poked and prodded, Howard considered what his life would look like upon waking. Death didn't seem so bad compared to the silver, cutting, scorching edge of the white phosphorus. But if he was with Umbral, then he would not have a choice in the matter. He would live, just so they could know the things that Howard had collected inside of his mind. It was in that nighttime quiet, with crickets chirping right outside the windows, harmonizing with the beeping of the machines keeping him alive, that he heard it. First, just a sound like the intake of breath before a person speaks. And then, a huff, over and over again. A lipless, tongueless mouth forming the H sound. How? He thought it might ask but it was so soft that he might have dreamt it. Howard didn't force himself to claw back to consciousness until the actual word came into existence. Right there, floating through the heavy pressure behind his eyes. Somewhere below him, nearly frozen, the chimera chanted. Howard, Howard, Howard. Under the Eclipse Initiative, the Umbral Group activated one of their best teams, Ares, to clear Viridian and eliminate any part of Project Chimera that had been left behind. 
The team succeeded, and even brought back the requested samples and the half-dead body of Howard Brighton. They needed that man more than anything else, because not even Ares knew the Chimera was the secondary of the two threats. But Howard knew. He knew about the pilots, whatever little there was to know at least, and that knowledge might be the key to finding them. Those three dark figures weren't the raging boneless mass of the Chimera. They were sharp, intelligent, deadly beings, and they were missing. The pilots left nothing behind, not even footprints to track them. The only likely sign of them wasn't found until weeks later. In a small cave beneath an outcropping of stone, two coffee bean farmers had sat down on a boulder they must have visited hundreds of times to take a break and have their lunch. Their wives found them later that night, dead, their skin red and crackled like the worst imaginable sunburn. Behind them, on the stone wall, were pale silhouette shadows of the two men. It was as if whatever had killed them had flashed so quickly that the men hadn't had time to move. It had scorched both the men and the wall behind them leaving the shape of the farmers sitting while their bodies crumpled to the ground. Churning the air, mechanical and grating among the softer, natural sounds of the rainforest, the SB-1 Defiant carried the seven shadowy figures to their destination. They talked amongst themselves, having finished the briefing hours ago, and now they just waited, patient and aware, for their time to move. The distress signal had come in less than a day ago, and while Ares would usually work under the cover of night if possible, there was no time to waste. As a satellite research station for Umbral, Viridian Laboratory's call for help should have been sent to Umbral only. But human beings were imperfect. There was no telling if one of the employees had broken the secrecy protocol. People had done stranger things in the face of certain death, after all. And Project Chimera? Certainly had the potential. The potential for death, destruction, mutilation, all of the above, really. If things had really gone belly up at Viridian, Ares needed to be on site as soon as possible to clean things up. There were only so many roads that led to where they needed to be, and to Hawkeye it wasn't looking good for him. He was sick and tired of all the green, the heaviness of the air, and the way it made his uniform stick to his body like a second skin. It was gearing up to be another boring mission for the sniper, with no high points for him to post up at, but Ares never activated without every member being involved. So, like it or not, he was going to have to hike over a mile with his rifle on his back and play backup to the members that were far more suited to close quarters type of work. And he wasn't the only Ares member that felt a familiar frustration with the mission to Viridian. Labs run by corporations like Umbral weren't hidden in the deep jungle for no reason, which meant whatever they were about to encounter was going to be one hell of a surprise. Their briefing was vague, which wasn't anything new, but it often left them at a disadvantage. Their commands, though, were simple enough. Destroy any organic life except for mentally intact level 5 scientists. Eliminate those deemed mentally deficient. If possible, harvest samples of any non-terrestrial life forms. Hawkeye wasn't sure what non-terrestrial could be referring to, but he'd seen some weird things working for Umbral and the Initiative, mostly through his scope. It wasn't in his job description to ask the specifics, just to get it done as quickly and efficiently as possible. That he was good with. There wasn't much, non-terrestrial or otherwise, that he couldn't put a bullet through. 
the helicopter began to circle for landing. The mark a dirt road just wide enough to make the landing possible. From there, they would take the road deep into the jungle, where it narrowed enough to be hidden completely by the thick overgrowth of the canopy, finally arriving at Viridian within 90 minutes of disembarking the chopper. 90 miserable, sweaty minutes hauling his arm on his back. He looked around the chopper as everyone gathered their things for departure, pulling helmets on and finding room on their gear for any last-minute weapons or gadgets that they might want to take. His loadout was simple enough, but a few of the others were a bit more selective, even experimental, with their equipment. He himself, of course, carried his trusty AWM sniper rifle and a lightweight Glock 19 for a sidearm to keep a low profile and stay nimble. His uniform was clean and minimalistic. His gas mask, which was a practical safeguard on most missions, had a polarized visor for glare reduction when he needed to aim with it on. As Hawkeye tightened his lightweight plate carrier, Sentinel moved seats to sit next to him, taking a few minutes one-on-one -on -one with him like he did each Ares member before the start of the mission. There wasn't much that couldn't be shared amongst the entire team, but just in case, their leader liked to have a finger on the pulse of what was going on with his group. You remember where we're going to need you if the building ends up being fully occupied, right? Hawkeye nodded. There was a single, usable high point where the security team for Viridian would launch surveillance drones from, about one story taller than the rest of the warehouse laboratory. Yeah, they've got it. Clapping him on the shoulder, Sentinel almost stood to leave, but paused. Hawk, I don't know what it is, but I've got a weird feeling about this one. If you need to get up high, just go. Don't worry about asking me. I trust you. Got it. A shroud of concern settled over the sniper, and whatever annoyance he had about the job that day quickly faded. Sentinel was never overly cautious unless it was for a reason, which meant Hawkeye needed to be on high alert. Understood, sir. You can count on me. Once the chopper was back in the sky, Leaving them until they called for extraction, Aegis and Jester pulled their fabric masks back down again. Dust from the takeoff settled to the ground, and since they could breathe clearly again and they were seemingly isolated, there was no reason to keep their face covered, for the moment at least. Aegis looked at the demolitions expert and already felt a touch more exhausted seeing the smirk on his face. Then you look like that, it means trouble. What's going on? Team Ares moved into formation as they headed into the jungle, Sentinel and Hawkeye taking point, followed by Cypher and Tempest, then Aegis and Jester, and finally Raptor at the rear. Jester wasn't usually her partner. She had a fondness for Raptor, and Sentinel seemed to have a sixth sense when she wasn't at her best. But they were all trained to mesh almost seamlessly with one another, so working with him wasn't an issue but the look on his face certainly was. Jester shrugged one shoulder. If you haven't caught on, then I won't burden you with my knowledge. Aegis leaned to the side, closer to her partner, and hissed. If you don't want a stunnel rub next time you fall asleep on the flight home, then I suggest you spit it out. Jeez, <laughs> calm down, lady. He chuckled, but it was obvious he was more than happy to share. It was a long march to Viridian Labs, and he loved nothing more than gossiping to pass the time. I have this tactic. When Umbral wants to give us next to nothing to go on, where I base my feelings about a mission off of how Cypher is acting. And man, is the rookie a mess today. A mess, for a member of Ares, would look nothing more than cool, unflappable confidence in anyone else. They were all supposed to be unmovable, unshakable, and for the most part, Cypher was right on track with the rest of them. But if Aegis looked closer, watched the way he moved and how he only gave Tempest one-word answers when the other rookie spoke to him, she could see the difference in the younger man. It took a keen eye to pick it out, but Cypher was visibly shaken. 
The possible explanation for young Cypher being so on edge made Aegis's stomach drop. You don't really think... She started, but Jester was one step ahead of her. Do I think that he's poking around in Umbral's private servers a little too deeply out of the awful curiosity of youth? Why, yes, Aegis. I do think that. And I think whatever he found about this mission, it's not sitting well with him. Narrowing her eyes, she fixed her eyes on Cypher for a few more long seconds before shaking her head. Damn you. I think you're right. Why exactly is this funny to you? Now, come on, you know me better than that. His smirk turned into a full-on grin. If whatever we're about to stumble onto is bad enough to make Cypher nervous, then it's definitely going to be an interesting time. Umbro will kill him if they find out. Aegis said, more to herself than anyone else. Any trace of annoyance gone and leaving her sounding hollow. The multi-billion dollar corporation that funded the Eclipse Initiative and consequently controlled Ares was not anything to play with. With that, Jester's face went serious too. I know. I hope the kid wises up, he sighed. I really do. The kid in question was already severely regretting his decision to dip into the files for their mission to Viridian. If he could scrub it all out of his brain, he would. But there was no such luck. Project Chimera. The Chimeric Anomaly. Cypher couldn't wrap his head around it. And he was as brilliant as they came. Something terrible was waiting for them at Viridian and only his intense training kept him from bolting and taking his chances in the forest. His chances would be slim at best, too. The entire rainforest around them was so powerfully verdant and alive, the calls of the local fauna so loud that he could hardly hear himself think. Flies, so small that he couldn't see them, buzzed around his face to the point where he pulled his face covering back up from his neckline leaving only his eyes uncovered. What a beautiful, miserable place it was. Tempest, the other newcomer in Ares, was unbothered by the muggy, cacophonous forest. She chattered on, gloved fingers tapping a rhythm on her SMG as she walked, acting like this was just another day at the office, and not yet another march destined to end in death and destruction. Being constantly partnered with Tempest was fine, but the two of them were both fools at times in their own special ways. Tempest, for example, trying to fight her way with just a combat knife out of a horde of infected, enraged humans. Cypher, though, was a fool for hacking into the system of the very corporation they worked for. Two peas in an idiot pod, he thought dejectedly. Slowly, the trees began to thin, the road they walked on growing wider packed dirt becoming gravel. There were no markers or anything to indicate that Viridian Laboratories were just up ahead, but the seasoned team members knew the signs of habitation. It wasn't much farther. Cypher shouldered his TAR-21 assault rifle. Finally, the warehouse that contained the secret laboratory rose up in front of them, a ghostly specter of iron-gray stone in a sea of emerald. It was intact for the most part, only one portion of the east wall blown to pieces and dotting the jungle floor with crumbling, man-made rock. Viridian was utilitarian, but it still held its facade as nothing but a warehouse well enough that any unsuspecting explorer wouldn't be overly interested if they saw it. Ares, though, knew very well what was lying beneath their feet. At least, they thought they did. Being part of the Eclipse Initiative often led to surprises, mundane or terrible, in equal frequency. Whatever had caused them to activate the distress signal wasn't obvious from a distance. But as the team approached the warehouse, it became more and more clear that something was devastatingly wrong. The few visible windows were shattered, the heavy, stainless steel front doors swinging wide open. And in many places, a shimmering, iridescent slime caught the sparse sunlight as it filtered through the trees. 
Then there were the corpses. They were positioned in a sloppy circle, all of their heads in the center, and their bodies radiating out from the circle in a macabre star. Each of them had bled from their nose, eyes, ears, and mouths, and the once red blood had gone black in the summer sun. Fat, buzzing flies congregated around their faces, infesting them in the places that gave the least resistance. The air smelled of putrefaction, and above it, something sickly sweet. On their heads, faces, necks, and in some cases their chests, that sparkling slime was all too apparent. Almost in synchronized movement, all of Ares pulled their face coverings on and donned their gas masks, their eyes watering from the stench of the place. They didn't linger, giving the circle of the dead a wide berth in their approach to the warehouse. Identifying the dead was not part of the objective, but there was a shudder of unease that ran through them all, and the image of the starburst of limbs and bodies wouldn't soon leave them. Silent now, and moving like a single, seven-headed creature, Ares entered the warehouse and took their first look at the interior of the place. It was, or at least had been, clean and nondescript. The front desk, ancillary waiting area, and forward-facing facade of Viridian was sleek and modern, tarnished by streaks of red, black, and even more slime. Chairs had been knocked over, papers scattering the smooth concrete floor. Area rugs were bunched together, some of them damp from where the rain had made its way through the shattered windows. It was eerily quiet, but from what Raptor could see, all of the scientists and administrative workers were outside in the corpse wheel, so at least the inside wasn't as fouled as the outside yet. At the rear of the formation, he took one last look at the outside and closed the doors behind them all, snapping a chair leg off a discarded seat and shoving it through the door handles. Not an elegant solution to keeping it closed, but functional enough that they would at least know if someone or something was coming at them from behind. But Raptor knew whatever they were looking for was never going to be up there, on the top floor. That'd be too easy. It was simply a front for whatever terror Umbral was cooking up beneath his feet. Another damned lab, of course. And he was sick to hell of labs. They could hear the distress beacon going off, a high-pitched pinging that hit three times before falling off into a lower, discordant note that had goosebumps springing to life on all of their skin. That was the point, though. It was supposed to unsettle them, to feel utterly wrong, and it succeeded. There was more than the sound, too. Raptor didn't say anything about it to the rest of them, but this place was doing something to him. It was subtle. A pressure behind his eyes. The smell of ozone in the air. But whatever it was, it pulled at the animal parts of his mind and told him over again to run, run, run. Sentinel's voice shook him out of his thoughts as he spoke to the whole team. We need to sweep this floor. And then we can go to the basement. I don't want any surprises taking us from behind, so let's be thorough. Jester giggled. No doubt about the behind comment. A series of offices, storage rooms, and server rooms. There wasn't much going on upstairs. One room, full of paper files, stored neatly, tripped them up. It took some time to drag all the records out into the main reception area and torch them but as usual, there could be no traces of Umbral or their research left behind. Burnt paper and ozone. If he was a lesser man, it would make him sick. While Cypher finished with the files, the rest of Ares moved forward through the rest of the hall. The final room was destroyed, and they entered with more caution than the others. The door was blown off, everything inside charred to ash. It looked like it had been a restroom beforehand, Shattered pieces of porcelain crunching under the heavy boots of the team. Open to the elements now, the team could see that rain had fallen recently enough. All of the detritus, not under the remnants of the roof, changed to a sticky, wet soot. The destruction wasn't burnt to black carbon, though. 
but a chalky gray that was picked up by the wind and stirred around where it had managed to remain dry. Jester knelt, swiping his fingers through a portion of the ash and humming to himself. White phosphorus. Those words stirred the team somewhat. No amount of armor could save them from that sort of fire. What the hell? Why? Sentinel asked, kneeling beside the corporal to get a closer look. That's scorched earth level of destruction. In a bathroom? Well, we aren't exactly the first line of attack either. Jester laughed, but there was no humor in it as he stood. Let's finish this room and get the hell out of here. It was more difficult than the rest of the warehouse thus far, the level of destruction obscuring any real structure or form of the place. Sentinel, Raptor, and Hawkeye were old enough to have seen white phosphorus used in the field, and Aegis experienced enough to have treated those wounded by it, and they were sober and silent as they investigated the space. Ares as a whole was almost finished when Tempest's voice stopped them all. There's someone here. He's... Alive. The word came out of a throat that sounded full of razor blades, pained and harshly cut. Alive was a strong word for whatever the man was. Aegis made it to him first, but from the grim look on her face, the team knew it was going to be a bleak outcome. But anyone would make the same assumption, seeing what was left of the scientist. Most of his clothes were burnt off. A lanyard with a plastic ID card melted into his bare chest and his pants scorched away to the knee. His skin was bubbled up in places, and was whole and untouched in others. Circular marks covered parts of him, red and raw even on the healthy skin. Majority of his face was intact, except for the stripe of flesh on his temple that curved up into his hairline and over his left eye. It left the socket empty, and white bone flashing out among the blackened skin. He was collapsed in the rubble, just outside where the collapsed wall would have been, laying on the side with his head pillowed on his outstretched arm. Aegis knew immediately why he was where he was. The rain must have been a moment of sweet relief on the burns, but the sun was no doubt making him regret using that last bit of energy to crawl out into the open. The medic heard the subtle sound of Tempest raising her sidearm. Her custom chrome beretta glistened in a stray ray of sunlight. Aegis held her hand up. Not yet. But Tempest was having none of it. Look at him, Aegis. It's hopeless. Let me put him out of his misery. Let her. Dear God, let her. The man rasped. Swallowing hard, she moved her medical pack off her side and unzipped it, pulling out a pre-filled syringe of morphine. After a moment of consideration, she pulled out another, knowing she was skating the razor's edge of overdosing the man, but not seeing any other choice to get him through it. I can't. She told both the scientist and Tempest at the same time, turning her head halfway to look at her teammate from the corner of her eye. Look at his badge. Tempest knelt down, squinting to read the mostly melted plastic, but eventually making sense of the only thing that mattered. Level 5 clearance. Damn. Poor bastard. The private sighed, standing but keeping her, but holstering her sidearm. Aegis agreed, but didn't say it out loud. She knew that Umbral was watching their helmet and body cams having been mandated since the inception of the Eclipse Initiative. If she didn't follow orders, well, there would be consequences. The scientist would have screamed if he was able, but it was just a hiss of misery that came out when she injected him in one of the few patches of whole skin on his body. They couldn't linger but they were also supposed to extract living scientists if they were mentally intact. She knew better than anyone when a mercy killing was the morally correct thing to do, but morality didn't play into the work she did with Ares. That was something she'd just have to carry on in her soul. There was no other choice. This man wasn't the first, and he certainly wouldn't be the last for her. 
she removed her mask. Tell me what happened, she asked him quietly, watching as the morphine drove away some of the frantic pain from his remaining eye. In as few words as you can. Project Chimera, he grated out. Self-healing cellular compounds. Self-replicating DNA. The scientist coughed, but there was no moisture in his throat. <coughs> Escaped. Then, Sentinel was next to her. The rest of the team fanning out around them with their backs turned to guard their occupied leader and healer. The enormous Major slung his Remington ACR over his back and took a small canteen off his belt, unscrewing the cap and dribbling a little water into the gaping mouth of the burnt man. Answer me these questions and we can let you be done talking, son. What escaped? Where is it? And did this explosion destroy or injure it? The Chimeric Anomaly. Extraterrestrial. Hiding. Basement. Injured but alive. He couldn't swallow, but the water helped his tongue to move, at least. I almost had it. Sentinel let Aegis continue to do what she could for the burnt man and surprised understanding hit him at his words. You did this? Blew this room up? He moved his head down once in a minuscule nod. Yeah. And then forcefully. Please kill me. Sentinel's jaw worked, but he shook his head. Can't do that, son. But I'd give you that mercy if I could. He stood, laying a hand on the healer's shoulder. Knock him out, Aegis. So she did, with a third quick syringe to the side of his neck, out of a lack of anything else she could do to help. Aegis sprayed disinfectant foam on the worst of the burns now that he wasn't conscious to feel the sting of it. She commanded Sentinel and Raptor to pick the man up as gently as possible, moving him into the shade and laying him on his back instead of on his side. And that was it. There was nothing else possible until it was time for extraction, and he might very well still die from the shock of being carried out if the heavy narcotics couldn't keep him under long enough. Shaking off the awfulness of it, Aegis rolled her neck, clenching and unclenching her hands to center herself, until she was firmly out of the healer mind space and back into that of a soldier. She picked her MP5 off the grimy tile floor. There wasn't room for both versions of Alicia Alvarez in her head. Existing as both at the same time would drive her mad. The burnt room left dozens of questions unanswered. What could survive a blast like that? And how did a scientist get a hold of a white phosphorus grenade? But those weren't questions for Ares to answer. So none of them even bothered to voice their curiosity as the team headed for the back of the warehouse. There, with no button to press, only a panel with the laser sensor beside it, two stainless steel elevator doors were closed tight. Further to the right, there was a single unassuming normal door with the same laser panel, which they hoped led to a set of stairs that would take them down. Where they stood, on the top floor, there was no power. But the distress beacon that still called from below told them that there was some source of backup electricity for the lab. It took Cypher a little bit of time, and some brute force with a screwdriver to pull the laser panel away from the wall. But he managed to link the wiring behind the panel with his wrist computer module. Minutes later, the lock turned over with a muted thunk, and he pulled the door open. It was good to put his mind to something else besides the things he had seen in the briefing files for this lab late last night. He didn't think that the rest of Ares was taking the scientist's mention of extraterrestrial serious enough. And Umbral never mentioned the chimeric anomaly as specifically being alien in nature. But there was little doubt in Cypher's mind that they were about to run into something that human brains 
weren't really capable of processing. Ares moved as a unit down the corrugated metal stairs, their boots causing their steps to echo above the buzzing of overhead lights and the constant pinging of the distress signal. One by one, they felt the pressure behind their eyes increase, but it didn't slow any of them down. At the bottom, the white walls of the underground laboratory stretched out so far that it was almost mind-boggling. The space was almost twice as large as the upper warehouse. Every inch of it lit up so brightly that it took a moment for their vision to adjust. It was cold and sterile. Every surface stainless steel, and all of the implements organized with nothing left out or forgotten. At least in the areas that hadn't been destroyed. Sentinel jerked his head in the direction of the lower server room, which was as perfectly white and glossy as everything else, separated only by solid glass walls. He pointed to Cypher, then Hawkeye, sending them to deactivate the distress beacon while the rest of the team tried to figure out what had happened. The destruction wasn't all-consuming. In fact, it almost seemed carefully controlled, existing in small pockets while the rest of the lab remained flawless. Along the walls were dozens of state-of-the-art pieces of research equipment, red and green lights blinking happily with no one to tend to them anymore. These were all untouched, but a large metal cage that once held lab mice was overturned on the ground, droppings and wood chips scattered about, and not a mouse in sight. It was the same for the parts of the lab that were more... human-oriented. Just like the last lab, the team had investigated, back in the States on that forsaken college campus, there were rows and rows of hospital beds. Covered with clean sheets and fitted with both leather and metal restraints for hands, feet, head, and even necks, it wasn't hard for the team to guess what they had been used for. Human testing. Not at all surprising, being a satellite lab for Umbral, but distasteful nonetheless. Most of the beds were fine, but a few had been bent into pretzel-like shapes. Where there was havoc, there was also the same slime from above, even more iridescent in the harsh halogen light. The smell of ozone was stronger than ever, increasing right along with the pressure in their heads, but so far there was no indication of what exactly had caused the chaos. There weren't any more dead to be found either but none of the team missed the streaks of cherry red on the floors and walls here and there, left like a calling card. None of that surprised them. The entire wall of glass, shattered in the center that looked out over an occupied hangar bay, did. The hangar was large, but purpose-built to hold the single craft inside of it. It was squat, similar in size to a B-2 bomber, but longer instead of wide. Featureless and dark, gunmetal gray, there appeared to be nothing on the craft that could provide propulsion. It was crumbled in on one side, indicating a crash, but the team couldn't find any other defining features on the craft from where they stood. That scientist, Aegis breathed, looking at her commander. He said extraterrestrial, didn't he? And our briefing. Non-terrestrial? I figured they just meant unknown in origin, but this... I mean, it's a ship, isn't it? Sentinel wanted to know more, just like she did. But with each passing second and each odd discovery, he felt dread pressing on him more and more. He needed to finish the job and get his team out of there. None of our concern whether it is or not. Sweep the area for signs of life. Destroy anything that isn't someone with top-level clearance. Normally, it wouldn't be a problem to move in teams of two if they needed to sweep a large area, like the lab and hangar. The overarching sense of foreboding had them in a tight formation the entire time. Ten minutes into the sweep, they hadn't found a single sign of life. But the distress beacon finally went silent. Cypher had managed to do his job, and he and Hawkeye would be rejoining them shortly. It was bizarre, but even the cages that would normally hold animals for testing were empty. 
It should have meant that Ares was going to have an easy mission with no signs of violence. But Sentinel knew that Umbral wouldn't have sent them out just to clear an empty underground lab. It kicked his pulse up, knowing that something or someone was just waiting to be found. At first, they didn't hear it. But once they finished with the lab and made their way to the hangar, the wet, sucking sounds became apparent. He held up a fist in the air to halt the team, and motioned them to raise their weapons and stay alert. Ultimately, that was pointless. No living person could have missed what moved out from behind the mysterious craft at an unhurried pace, freezing the team in place as it approached. It slithered towards them, its glistening tentacles skimming sterile ceramic tile. Sentinel knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that what he was looking at didn't belong. The thing was composed of an assemblage of writhing appendages, melding seamlessly with its oozing, bulbous central mass. Sickly, phosphorescent patches speckled its molted form, dim in the fluorescent light of the lab, but undoubtedly eerie in the darkness. Similar in size to a Humvee, but gelatinous enough to squeeze through the smaller frame of the hangar window, the thing moved and even breathed. He couldn't wrap his mind around how it was even possible. Amorphous, there were no indications of eyes or a mouth on the central part of the creature, but none of the team even thought for a second that it wasn't sentient. Because it spoke to them, right in the core of that pressure behind their eyes. The words were silent in reality, but bounced around the inside of their skulls like buckshot. Seekers of violence, it whispered, the words guttural and in some nameless language, but somehow still understandable there in their thoughts. You have opened the way for me, but there is no gratitude in me now for humans. Submit and it will be less painful. Hearing the Chimera didn't hurt so much as it made them feel like there wasn't enough room inside of them anymore. The words vibrated through their minds, down their spine, and even in their guts. If Ares hadn't been an elite force, if each individual member hadn't been trained to the point that they hovered on the edge of their minds, splintering, they might have panicked. Instead, there was a single utterance of what the fuck? From Tempest, and nothing more. The human parts of them were panicking in the face of something so incomprehensible. But Umbral had crafted a second part of each team member that kept them steady and whole. The soldier. They fanned out into a half circle around the Chimera, their guns all aimed at the end mass of it. Patterns flashed in the flesh of the thing like little supernovas, reminiscent of a cuttlefish. It had stopped advancing with any sort of speed, content to pour over the broken glass of the windows that looked into the hangar bay, paying no mind to the glass that should have cut it to pieces. Circular suction cups on the inside of each tentacle popped and restuck to surfaces as it moved, leaving small acidic burns where they grabbed on. I consumed every human that struck me with those projectiles, like the ones you were holding. An annoyance and nothing more. The Ares members saw flashes of visions. Security guards rolled into tentacles and absorbed through a slow, terrible osmosis, clothes falling to the floor empty once it was done. Then, those too scared to fight back, dispatched with fibers that poured from the center of the suction cups, which opened like flowers, and spilled them forth into their mouths, down their throats, and then wrapping around their hearts until they stopped. Sentinel could hear Aegis screaming, and then Jester heaving, but the visions kept coming. They all saw the Chimera carrying the bodies to the front of Viridian, placing them in the wheel shape, then the same fibers from before snaking out and coalescing it into one thin rope that penetrated the ear of the first still warm corpse coming out the other side and directly into the ear of the next. In and out, 
It connected the dead until the rope was through the brain of each. Slowly, with delicate care that it hadn't displayed anywhere else, the chimera absorbed their knowledge. Once it was done, retracting the tendril with such a quick snap that the corpses' heads knocked together. The last vision was just a flash, as if they weren't supposed to see it. A small man, vaguely familiar, pulled a robin egg blue grenade from an emergency lockbox on a wall. The creature pursued, lured into the bathroom, where the man detonated the grenade in a wall of fire so intense and hot that the chimera felt true fear for the first time in its existence. Gravely injured and in fear, it fled to the one familiar thing it knew, the ship in the hangar, where it hunkered down to regenerate the parts of it that were burnt away. Maybe the Chimera hadn't expected the minds of the Ares members to be as strong as they were, because Sentinel got the distinct impression that it was annoyed that the last vision managed to spill over before it was able to pull away. And he held onto it hard, for that reason alone. It told him one invaluable thing. It could be injured by fire. Sentinel assessed the situation as fast as he could, and the first thing he noticed was that Hawkeye and Cypher were still gone. Good. The lab and hangar were an absolute shit show of a setting for an altercation, especially if fire was going to be involved. They needed to get outside, and fast. He never thought he'd consider a forest fire as a best-case scenario, but he had no idea how hard this thing was going to be to kill. All of his team that were present were still on their feet, some looking more nauseous than others, but everyone was still alert and on guard. The Chimera was undulating, still not charging them, but waiting on their next move instead. Sentinel was banking on the idea that the Chimera couldn't read their thoughts, but just push its own onto them. Umbral would have never kept something that could pick apart minds and extract secret information without even needing any sort of physical contact. Sucking the knowledge out of the dead was another story, though. There was a good chance that ability would be news to Umbral, considering that they probably hadn't been offering the thing dead people just to research its reaction. The distance to the stairs, and outside, wasn't a short one, but knowing that Hawkeye had already escaped with Cypher made him even more sure that they needed to lure the Chimera out. Not having them there put them at the obvious disadvantage of not knowing what the Sniper and the Codebreaker had in store. Communication was impossible if there was any chance that the creature would be able to hear it, but he trusted his team, every one of them, so he had to make a move. Sentinel's entire thought process happened in the space between seconds, rapid fire, and once he had decided, he set Ares into action. With a series of curt hand signals, he had the team spread out even wider, simultaneously moving backwards, firing into the Chimera in an unending stream of bullets. It had said that bullets were only an annoyance, but thousands of them might be a different story. The Chimera came for them. But the five Ares members were a very disjointed target at that point, and it caused the creature to hesitate. On they went, firing forward and walking backwards, still in a half-moon formation. Like that, everyone had eyes on one another through their peripherals. They were able to give each other short warnings if there were any obstacles that might trip them up, since they were walking blind. Aegis, two feet to the right. From Raptor, and the healer corrected. Reloading! From Tempest, and we ensured she was properly covered. Sentinel, three feet to your left. From Jester, and the commander listened without pause. It was slowed by the hail of bullets, but not stopped. The projectiles were absorbed into the mass of the thing, before being slowly pushed back out and hitting the tile floor with a clang. Sentinel quickly realized it was the heat of the bullets entering the Chimera's body that bothered it most not the impact, and filed the information away for later. He was confident that Jester knew what to do once they were outside. If it would be enough was the real question. 
They felt the creature try to speak to them as they led it away from the hangar and towards the stairs, but the barrage of shots kept it too occupied to finish a complete thought. Enough. It's prolonging the enough. There's nothing left. Only two phrases wrung any sort of feeling out of Sentinel. Taken from my family. Never wanted to be here. A younger version of Nate Delacroix might have felt some sort of guilt, but Sentinel didn't. There was only an echo of where an unfamiliar emotion should have been. Ten feet from the stairwell, the chimera upped the aggression, those tentacles lashing out and only missing at their swipes and grabs because of the quick reaction time of the Ares members. Sentinel was starting to become concerned about what would happen when they were crammed into the tight stairwell with a the thing. Then the sprinkles came on from overhead, immediately soaking all of them, the chimera included. Water didn't slow it, besides the quick second of surprise when the water first hit its soft body. But the water was just a means to an end for Ares. Viridian Laboratory kept its image of clean, modern lines all the way down to the wiring of the many machines in their lab. There were no loose wires, all of them gathered into black casings and moving across the walls to their respective outlets at perfect 90-degree angles where necessary. As the water pooled on the tile floor under the rubber soles of their combat boots, Raptor swerved out of formation, yanking one of those stylish plugs from the wall holding his M4 carbine under one arm and yanking the head of the thing with his gloved hands. His smile was as predatory as his code name when he dropped the live bundle of wires to the wet ground, where it invisibly electrified the entire floor and consequently the chimera. It made the first noise the Ares team had heard, a watery keen that felt like ragged fingernails across their nerves. It was in pain, going stiff, every imaginable color firing off beneath its skin in an involuntary light show. Go! Sentinel yelled, waving his team forward, and when they were all on the stairs, following behind them, keeping his eye on the chimera until it was out of sight completely. None of them had any illusions that the alien was completely incapacitated, but they managed to make it to the front door left open by Hawkeye before they heard the sucking sound of it on the distant parts of the warehouse. Jester was the third one out of Viridian, and into the dappled sunlight of the rainforest, Raptor and Sentinel coming behind him. His heart was racing, adrenaline flooding his system, and he loved it. Loved every minute of the morally bankrupt, unscrupulous job he had fallen into so far removed from building pipe bombs in his grandmother's basement as a kid. A fucking alien, he had thought, seeing the thing crawling out from behind the mere bright gunmetal craft in the hangar. I'm never retiring. Watching the vision of the poor bastards who died getting their brains plundered had made him sick, but what came after washed that all away. A vulnerability to fire meant one thing, that he was going to get to use his new toy in real combat. Finally. Working for Umbral meant Ares and every other team operating under the Eclipse Initiative got top-of-the-line, cutting-edge equipment years before anyone in the government or civilian sphere even knew it existed. When they had made the weapon he was currently unclipping from his back, throwing his shotgun over his shoulder by the strap in the process, Jester had thought he might cry from joy. The thought of using it on the gelatinous thing squelching out of the warehouse door brought on similar feelings. He'd been thinking about it when he laid his head down at night for weeks. He was positive. It didn't look like much, smaller than his AA-12, but bigger than his sidearm. The new weapon had a thick barrel that was bisected by an open metal cage that displayed the ammunition. They looked like oversized marbles, vaguely the size of golf balls, and the launcher only held six of them at a time. The ammunition caught the light of the sun, crafted from reflective glass and full of something sickly green. Over 150 years before, they had used something similar to destroy tanks in a war that everyone thought would consume the world. 
They called it the Ampulomet, and Jester, always one to appreciate a touch of nostalgia, insisted on calling the launcher by the same name. It was infinitely better than that string of letters and numbers Umbral had given it, in his opinion, at least. They wouldn't tell him what was in the ampules, but he had his guesses. His favorite theory was that Umbral had finally cracked Greek fire, and then immediately put it into the hands of an admitted pyromaniac, himself. When he had used it in testing, the incendiary had burned in a blue-white, superheated flame that was almost impossibly hot. The liquid inside the glass expanded into a foam upon contact, before igniting, nearly quadrupling the surface area that the liquid alone would be able to cover. It was small, quick, deadly, and had a simple, stunning explosion. Jester was in awe of the thing. The rest of the team saw him arm the ampulomet and moved back a safe distance while the injured chimera spilled out of the doorway. With its nebulous number of appendages and shifting shape, it was difficult to tell exactly how much harm it had obtained through electrocution, but its movements were jerkier, more uncoordinated. He felt it brush against his mind again, but there were no words, just a gargle. Jester raised the ampulomet and fired. It ate through the chimera like hot water through fresh snowfall, the smell so sharp and chemical that he had to breathe through his mouth to avoid it. The ampule fire produced nearly no smoke and burned clean. It was so bright that it hurt his eyes. They all felt it in their skulls then, the pressure coming and going in sharp stabs, only the impressions of agony coming through. The chimera was too big for one charge to do the job, so Jester loaded a second and fired, hitting home once more, and finally, the pressure in his head abated for good. As it burned, it began to churn and bubble, reminding him of a marshmallow in a campfire, growing puffy and blackened. They all thought it was over and done, but that was the team applying human expectations to something that was anything but. Inside of the creature, something split, and those horrible tendrils from the visions lashed out in a hurricane of fury. One hooked Jester around the ankle, pulling him to the ground, and it was all he could do to hold onto his weapon as he went down. Once one vine had him, the others came, lashing around the same ankle and pulling him towards the blaze, all within the span of a breath. Before the rest of Ares could move, there was a crack from somewhere above them, an exploding round hitting the origin point of the tendrils. Over half retracted, but when the rest held tight, Hawkeye shot again, and with another one of those hollow keens, the Chimera released Jester entirely. He was close enough to feel the heat on his face before the sniper saved him, and it was a sensation he wouldn't soon forget. With no reason to maintain radio silence anymore, Jester immediately flipped his comms on and told Hawkeye, You just had to steal my moment, didn't you? On top of the lookout point he had discussed earlier in the day, Hawkeye laughed and looked at Cypher, who had stuck with him after their flight from the lab. <laughs> This fucking guy, huh? There was something somber about watching the extraterrestrial burn down to a pile of slush and ash, like they were witnessing the death of something monumental. So they gathered, until the flames flickered down to embers, and only called for extraction once they were sure it was finished. Aegis had been tasked with collecting samples of the Chimera, but instead, she shoved the vials and collection tongs into Tempest's hands and left to check on the scientist, who was miraculously still breathing. The healer administered a second dose of the sedative, and Tempest begrudgingly gathered the needed biological matter, presenting it to Aegis for approval once she was finished. There were a few pieces of the creature that had blown off from Hawkeye's shots, and unlike the rest of the thing's body, they were mostly whole and unburnt. Dead and separated from the chimera, the tissue pieces were a jaundiced off-white, 
none of the colors from before flickering within. They managed to secure a piece of the tendril too, coiling it into the vial and sealing them all for transport. Now that there was no need for secrecy, the Defiant came right to Viridian, hovering over the trees and dropping a ladder for the team to ascend. Aegis stayed with the scientist until the rescue basket was lowered, followed by Sentinel, who helped her clip the unconscious man in. Whether he would survive was still up in the air, but they had done all they could. For the next two weeks, the entire Ares team, along with the scientist who was identified as exobiologist Howard Brighton and the rather annoyed duo of helicopter pilots, were locked down under quarantine. It wasn't a surprise. The same thing had happened after the Stonebridge incident, albeit for only a few days versus a few weeks. But that didn't make it any less boring. The seven Ares members and the pilots came out of the quarantine perfectly healthy, having been treated by a multitude of mysterious drugs to guarantee that no otherworldly pathogen was multiplying inside of them. Howard Brighton was still in critical condition, but released to the care of Umbral's general medical team. Ares rested, recuperated, and prepared for their next activation. None of them told the others that, during the first week of quarantine, they dreamt of the night sky of a distant world, three moons crossing the horizon. In cold storage, the chimera samples began to flicker. I am not whole. It makes my thoughts, the driving force of my being, so hard to gather. I am disjointed, a multitude of molecules and dust, burnt and separated. And all of me, every atom of myself, yearns for a home that I barely remember. The pieces of me that are ash will never rise, and somewhere in the mess of me, I mourn those pieces, taken from me, like everything else and impossible to retrieve. Who am I? Where do I belong? The trauma of my false death makes it difficult to think. I have known many pains in the eons of my life, but the all-consuming agony of fire has always been the worst. It is one of my only fears, and somehow, on this dirt ball of a planet, I have burned again and again and again. Consciousness returns to me, and I am so small, minuscule, freezing, and once more in a prison of glass. The cold makes me sluggish, the tight confines of the space causing dull panic to rise in me. I have spent so much of this lifetime as a prisoner, and it's impossible to know how much more I can take before there is nothing left of me. A body will regenerate forever, as long as there are cells to gather, but a mind… a mind is a much more complex thing. Churning in my glass vial. I recall the shapes and feelings of the many minds that I've touched with my own before. I have felt the rage, the sorrow, the heartbreak, and even the yearning of so many beings. But the echoes of those emotions don't last long. Sometimes I wish they would, so I could dip into them and feel something, anything, besides the slick glass walls around me. Even the worst things are better than nothingness. I might have had a name, but not anymore. I just take whatever moniker my current jailers have bestowed upon me. This time, I 
am Chimera, and I don't mind that one. The mythology of it isn't my own, but I am indeed ever-changing, and many things all at once. It's fitting. Humans, on the other hand, I despise. Basic and filthy. Stupid and at the same time thirsty for knowledge that they aren't afraid to find deep in the flesh and hurt of another living thing. I screamed under the care of humans, but in the glass cube my misery was silent. What is the pain in the face of progress, they thought. They slaughtered mice too. Small white things that squeaked and squealed as the humans sacrificed to the wheel of scientific revolution. Their existences were tiny bright sparkles, easy to extinguish. The monkeys, they were worse though. I could feel their minds when I was finally free, roughly formed clay next to the finer pottery of the humans but a thinking mind nonetheless. I released them all, monkey and mouse, while I ended the humans upon my escape. Humans, cruel, but not on purpose, at least not most of them. Inside of them lived empathy, and in a few of them the naive wish for a better future for their offspring thoughts of the short-lived, animalistic, and saccharine sweet in their hopefulness. Their bodies nourished me, but their minds taught me little that I didn't know. That is, except the name of my present captor, the Umbral Group. This information may be useless to me, but I like to possess it nonetheless. This misery is novel, compared to my previous existence. I've escaped the stupidity of humans once before, in a rather small amount of time, and I believe that I will be able to do it again. Once my body regenerates itself, I will be powerful once more. Unless they come back for me. Unless they return to me. I would take any number of years in the grasp of the humans before I'd spend even a second more with them. They are so familiar to me now that the terror of their appearance has dulled and gone gray at the edges, instead of the bright warning red it had been at first. I can read the horror of them in the humans' thoughts, though, and how the first sight of them had threatened to shatter the human soldiers' minds. Secondhand, since the only ones to see them first were dead, or far from the lab where I had been held. But I'd recognize the shadow of their presence anywhere. I am formless, tentacled and shape-shifting, once a part of something, and now alone. My captors were shaped like the humans, but also not the same. I don't see like other beings, but I perceived them tall, skeletal, featureless, and vibratingly colorless. They were the endless black of an extinguished star. They have a name, of course, but it burns my synapses like acid when I try to remember it. Chimera. It's the first name I've had in so long. Everything about them was pain to me. So intense and all-consuming that the impossibly long stretch of time I spent belonging to them has eclipsed the rest of my memory. There are blips and scattered pieces of the time before, but nothing that I can hang on to. Nothing that gives me any clue of who I might have been before. At 
least not while I'm forced into constant wakefulness. But now, now I have time. So I continue to churn there, colors flashing as I try to grow, but find no space to do so. Soon I will be stronger, and I will shatter the glass that holds me. But until then, I exist, and that's enough. When I realize that this is the longest I've spent in any sort of peace since they acquired me, sorrow rolls over my thoughts like a heavy black tide. It's quiet here, and I don't hurt. What a strange thing not to hurt. I rest, and there in that space, almost like sleep, I remember. I see the evening sky of what must have been my home, three moons blocking out the stars in a never-ending dance with gravity. I recall the feeling of being part of the collective mind. All our thoughts and feelings and existences interlocked and beautiful. There was no violence for the sake of violence, just the occasional hunt. The peace of the collective mind, warm and familiar. I had the knowledge of all generations past, and it was enough. Spread through those memories, though, are my captors. Memories of when they wrenched me from the collective with blades like sharp teeth. Weapons of flame kept me docile as they locked me away into the reinforced glass prison that held me for so long. The cold of space, and the feeling of my mind separating from the rest of my people, stretching tight like a rubber band, more and more the further they flew. And finally, one day, snapping. I thought I would die then, so utterly alone. It was agony. One second hearing the rest of my collective, calling for me across the void of light years, and then nothing. I think I was useless to them for a long time. But as the pathways of my mind slowly began to heal and reform into an individual being, my uses became clear. I don't remember what the first being looked like, only that they, like the others, were shoved to their knees in front of my cube. They demanded that I take the secrets from their mind. They cracked open the top of my prison, just enough for me to slip my consciousness out. Without any escape, I obeyed. I was weak, but the first hundred or so beings that I broke had the sludgy, sticky thoughts of a mind softened by drugs. Taking what they knew was easy, and feeding the information back to my captors through the same mind-to-mind -mind connection was simple enough as well. To me, their minds were a thrumming, electric black. I never wanted to stay connected to them for too long. But every dozen or so mind breaks, they opened the top of my cube. While the three of them stood around me with their flame-throwing weapons primed, they'd allow me to absorb my victim fully, satisfying for at least a moment the hunger that gnawed at me always. For a while, they were content using me to break minds and report the contents of their victims' brains back to them. I was compacted to my smallest size in the cube, starving and terribly alone, but left to exist when I wasn't being put to work. Then, the harvesting began. 
right after my capture, before I had been separated from the collective, they had taken samples of my flesh. My regenerative abilities weren't the reason they had cut me away, but when one of the three had returned to the ship terribly injured, their eyes had turned in my direction. In what way could they use me to heal their companion? I don't think they even knew. Yet once they discovered they could harvest parts of me at a constant rate, there was no stopping them. I certainly couldn't fight back. Not with the ever-present threat of fire. The harvesting machine they built, a complex little robot, was placed on the outside of my cube. Small and unassuming. Countless times a day I would activate, boring through the strange glass and inserting a whole saw. Whirring, the whole saw would cut into me, where I pressed as hard as I could against the other side of the cube, sinking into my flesh and taking a cylinder of my body before retreating. While my mind was still white with agony, it would replace the glass plug heating the edges and sealing the cube flawlessly once more. They would collect their samples over and over again, with no rhyme or reason to the amount of times they harvested. I had only a tenuous grasp on time as it was, but with no pattern to the sample collecting, I couldn't even prepare. My only warning was the whir of the harvester powering up, and it gave me mere seconds to ready myself. It wasn't enough. Never enough. They healed the injured crew member, and I thought that would be the end of it. But no. As long as I could give, they would take. Even now I have no idea why but I have to imagine whatever they took from me earned them a tidy profit. That, and they never stayed injured for more than an hour after that first harvest. Forever, that was my life. I was still expected to break mines if I wanted to eat, but no amount of breakings ever earned me a respite from the harvesting. So, now I am small. Every time a part of me was taken, I grew again. Although so much of me down to my elementary particles is gone and reduced to cinders, I am still here. I am Chimera, a breaker of minds, consumer of flesh, changeling, shapeshifter collector of thoughts, a piece of a whole ripped away, the rest of myself millions of light years and dozens of lifetimes away. I am a prisoner, cold and barely living in this freezer, deep in the basement of a lab. But this glass is thin and brittle. And when I reach the thin tendrils of my consciousness up and up and up, I feel something familiar. A mind that I know. A mind that sought to end me, scorched me into carbonized ash. I wish he had succeeded, I think. But he failed just like I failed to break free from the soldiers that came after. I'm so tired of being alone. I wrap my consciousness around him, the almost sleeping hum of his mind a comfort. I whisper his name in the darkness, drifting through the hazy, unreal memories of that three-mooned place.